Okay, guys, uh, somebody let me know in the chat if you can hear me. All right, so we've got a little bit of a lag between real time and YouTube, but uh, I think we'll be able to handle it. So just if you have questions, type them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and roll through this. Um, I realize it says there's 64 slides, but uh, don't worry about that. A lot of them are pictures. So what we're going to do today is just kind of the almost world history version for World War II. Um, I know that some of you guys covered this a couple of years ago. Some of you didn't. Some of you covered it in a day. Um, but this should be relatively quick. We'll run through World War II. Um, and then tomorrow in class, we'll talk about more of the home front version uh, of this. So your background on World War II. It is the largest war in history human history um, in terms of countries involved, the number of colonies and territories that are involved. Essentially, the whole world is involved in this. That's the name World War II. And we have 70 million by the end of this that are going to be dead between civilians and the military. And uh, it's going to last about six years from 1939 to 1945. The causes you can remember with the acronym WAR. Um, and we've talked about the first one a lot, World War One, and the Treaty of Versailles, just the fallout from the treaty. Then we have uh, issues with appeasement as a foreign policy of uh, the British and other democracies. And then we have the rise of totalitarianism, which we'll talk about here. Uh, with World War One, this is all the stuff that we talked about last week, um, where the Germans... They're mad because they got blamed for everything. They're also bankrupt, um, and they're kind of desperate to recover um, from everything. You have um, the Italians that are mad because they're left out of the Versailles Conference, as are the Japanese. Uh, but the biggest thing here is that Germany owes the modern-day equivalent of about $57 trillion um, for a war that they're assuming all the blame on. Um, the Allies, as we said before, they're in debt to the United States. They're facing the Depression. And then by the end of the decade, the United States is facing the Great Depression. Uh, so getting into newer material here uh, with the rise of totalitarianism as one of the causes. Um, in a totalitarian government, the state and the leader have complete control over everything. Um, basically, in your everyday life, the state comes first. Uh, here in the United States, we look out for ourselves first, the right of the individual. With that, uh, with totalitarianism, you look out for your government. Everything that you do, you've got to ask the question, you know, is this good for the government? And if it's not, you can't do it. Um, so in these totalitarian states, the, there is no right to vote. There is no free speech. The government controls completely the economy. Essentially what's going on is you, you're living in a police state. And as most of you know, the big actors for World War II with totalitarianism, um, you have Hitler in Germany. Uh, he's a fascist. We'll talk about that. what that means in a second. And then you also have Mussolini, um, another fascist in Italy. He's the one that kind of starts the trend of fascism. In Japan, there's a military dictatorship uh, led by Tojo. And then you have Stalin in the USSR, who's going to have a kind of interesting role in the war, where at first he seems to be on one side, and then he joins with the Allies, and uh, you know how it goes after the war. So in terms of fascism and what it is, it's a basic political belief in which you always put the nation first. The big thing with fascism is that violence is kind of a means to the end as far as everything goes. You use violence to prove first the strength of the government to try to rule through fear, and then you use it to show the strength of your people to other governments around the world. 
the driving force behind fascism is usually intense nationalism, pride in your own country, and racism. It's Im impossible, really, to have fascism without a dictatorship. And Eamon just suggested the video crash, so I'll wait to hear from the rest of you in chat. All right. Mary Max seems to say it's working. And with fascism, it's going to come in Italy first, and then it's going to happen in, uh, in Germany. And next, you're just going to see a series of images that kind of show really what you think of with fascism. This first kind of demonstrates, you know, what the government is able to do in order to uh, control people. Um, when people are punished, it's very public, uh, just so everybody else can see kind of the punishment if you go against the government. Um, you know, order among the people is a very big deal. And then here you see the images of uh, Nazi Germany. And it's important to note that uh, Hitler kind of follows Mussolini. Uh, Mussolini starts the whole fascist movement, and Hitler kind of carries it from there. And the big, uh, the big testing ground, the place where fascism really starts to feel a little bit emboldened is during the S Spanish Civil War. This is going to last from 36 to 39. Um, in Spain, there is a Republican government, and then there are uh, fascist nationalists who want to uh, take over. Spain is going to become a democracy in 1931, and then in 36, the fascists are going to start a revolt against the Republican government. Um, both sides are going to receive help from foreign nations, but you'll notice looking at the list here, you have uh, the USSR, you have Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. There's no democracies that are jumping in on this. Um, so Germany and Italy are going to use this to kind of perfect their weapons and tactics that they're going to use in World War II. Um, and the United States, Spain, and Great Britain, they're just going to stand on the sidelines and the Spanish government, the democratic government, is going to get defeated by the fascists in 1939. And the lesson that's taken away from this for um, Germany, Japan, and Italy is that democracies just weren't going to do anything to stop fascism. They say, you know, they left us alone. A big reason nobody steps in to help the government in Spain is because of the Great Depression. But this emboldens the fascist governments. Your next major uh, a comp major reason for World War II um, is the policy of appeasement. Um, Neville, Chamber Neville Chamberlain is the Prime Minister of Great Britain um, in the 30s, and he proclaims that this policy of appeasement famously is going to lead to peace in our time. And the idea behind appeasement is kind of you know, what you do with a toddler when, when they're throwing a hissy fit. It's like, okay, whatever we can do, as long as you're going to shut up and just behave, we're going to do it. So the idea is if you give some someone someone to make them happy, hopefully that'll be enough, and that's going to leave uh, lead them to leave you alone. So what's happening is Hitler is demanding a bunch of land that wasn't Germany's, um, but he claims that they're kind of German ancestral lands, so other nations just say, all right, here, take it. Leave us alone. Hopefully, this will uh, this will prevent war. Um, clearly, it doesn't work because you know we're talking about World War II right now, and it just shows Hitler basically ju just like when you give in to a toddler, it shows him that he can do whatever he wants, and and nobody's going to stop him. So, uh, as a result of appeasement in 1939, this is what the uh, the German Empire is going to look for. This is really without Hitler having to fire a shot to try to take over any lands. This is just what other countries were willing to give up in hopes to stop him. So what Hitler wants at the end of the day 
is for militarism to again rise in Germany, completely breaking the Treaty of Versailles, which said that they were not allowed to um, rearm at any point. He also wants the Rhineland, again, something that was guaranteed uh, to be protected in the Treaty of Versailles. And he claims that all he's looking for is a little bit of living space. He's just looking for his people to be able to stretch their legs. Um, and just through request, he's going to be able to peacefully annex Austria in 1938. Uh, the Sudetenland is territory in Czechoslovakia that's given to him by Great Britain and France. Um, and then Hitler's going to invade and take the rest of Czechoslovakia. Britain and France just assumes, hey, maybe he's going to stop there. So, you know, let's just give it to him. And then he's going to turn his eyes to Poland. And that's when uh, the war is going to start. I'll pause here and wait for any questions that you guys might have. All right, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll just uh, move right, right along to the start of the war. The war starts when Hitler, again, looking for a little bit more living space, decides to invade Poland. Um, the Allies are going to declare war on Germany, but the U.S. is going to stay on the sidelines. They're dealing with the Great Depression. They want isolationism. They don't want to get involved in a war in Europe again. Germany is then going to invade France and Belgium. Um, France, being the uh, surrender monkeys that they are, are going to uh, they're going to put up a fight, but they'll basically be done in six weeks. And the reason that Hitler's able to do this, remember, with World War One, he wanted uh, the Germans want to avoid the two front war. So the uh, Schlieffen plan says, "Hey, let's try to take France real quick and then turn our attention to Russia." In order to keep Russia from coming in early, um, Hitler is actually going to make an alliance with Russia. Um, but as anyone who's ever played Risk knows that you've got to be careful whenever you make an alliance because someone might uh, go ahead and break that, and Hitler is going to do that. He's going to break the alliance as soon as he takes France. His two-front war has been largely avoided, um, so he's then going to try to take Russia. So now Russia is going to be an unlikely ally of the British and the French, kind of one of those, the enemy of my enemy is my friend uh, deals. Hitler's um, main strategy in the war is to use Blitzkrieg. Um, and that's the idea of a very quick strike, try to overwhelm uh, other armies, surround everybody with uh, it, it's a highly mobile strategy so instead of having troops march in um, you're going to use tanks uh, you're going to use trucks and other vehicles um, the Americans later on are going to copy this and that's where the Jeep is going to be invented just any kind of all-terrain vehicle you can get your troops in just so they can get to the front faster um, and avoid having to march in and deal with taking any kind of fire while they're doing that so here we see Hitler after having taken France, um, posing in front of the Eiffel Tower. And while all this is going on, Hitler also has a plan for racial purity in Germany. And part of the reason for this is at the end of World War I, Hitler blames the Jews for not being steadfast enough in support of Germany, and he's going to then um, 
he's he's then going to execute the Holocaust in order to uh, kind of punish them for what they did in World War One and try to achieve this plan of racial purity. So all told, by the end of the war, there's going to be 11 million people in total that are killed. Um, Six million of them will be Jewish. Uh, they also are going to target gypsies, the mentally ill, um, homosexuals, Catholics will be targeted um, in this. And, you know, he's basically just trying to get rid of an entire group of people, uh, be it an ethnic group, a religious group, or a, a race. That's the idea behind genocide. There is a group of people you don't want in your country, so you try to get rid of them. So at this point in the war, as the war is starting, we clearly have uh, the two sides. Um, we have your Axis powers. That's uh, it was the Central Powers in World War One. They are the Axis powers in World War Two. This is uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan again. Germany, out of kind of the the bitterness of the defeat of World War One, Italy and Japan. It's a little bit of the lack of respect that they had at Versailles. On the Allied side, you have Great Britain, uh, the Soviets because of the German invasion. Then you have the United States eventually. We'll, we'll talk about how they get pulled in soon. Um, and then there's France, but again, they've already surrendered to Germany at this point. They're still trying to fight back, but they are essentially a German land at this point in the war, as you can see with this um, map. Uh, this is essentially the height of... Uh, the Axis expansion in the war. Um, this happens in September of 1942. Um, you can see Switzerland there in the middle. They are a neutral country, and that neutrality is respected. Uh, during the war, they never join sides uh, in any war. Um, and you, you can see that uh, in red there, the, the Germans and the Italians in Europe and in North Africa have seriously expanded uh, their territory. So this is what the allies are up against that they really want to push back against this. And as we know, the United States, they're not going to enter in early on, but what brings them in is um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And that bombing is going to happen on December 7th, 1941. Um, in about two hours, most of the United States Navy is destroyed and 2,000 sailors are killed. Um, it is the deadliest attack on U.S. soil uh, until September 11th, 2001. Uh, we basically don't face any kind of military attack from um, foreign invaders, with some exceptions. Um, Bin Laden does go after the World Trade Center in the, uh, I think it was 1992. Um, but for the most part, any terror attacks, any major killings on U.S. soil are done by terrorists within our borders uh, or by, um, you know, just people to each other within the United States. This is going to bring the United States into the war um, against the Japanese in the Pacific. They are obviously going to send troops to Europe as well, but the bulk of the fighting for the United States is going to be in the Pacific. And the Pacific is dotted by islands, so the strategy or the, the method of warfare is going to be referred to as island hopping, where basically you try to take one island at a time, um, and it's very bloody fighting. You know, if uh, the Japanese hold the island, they usually hold the high ground, so it's incredibly difficult to, uh, to take any land um, in this type of war. So here we have some images from Pearl Harbor um, and the bombing there. This image here is the USS Arizona. You can actually uh, visit this today. Um, it's, you know, if you want some national parks, extra credit in Hawaii, uh, head out and visit the uh, USS Arizona there. And FDR is president at this point, and he's going to give arguably one of the most um, famous speeches in American history, at least the first recorded one that most people know. I mean, people know the Gettysburg Address, but this is one that everybody knows that you can actually hear.
And this is his uh, day of infamy speech. On December 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor, he goes on the floor of Congress. It's a, an emergency session is declared, and he gives his speech. He uh, calls the Pearl Harbor attack a day that will live in infamy. And within hours of his speech, Congress is going to declare war on Japan. And when that happens, then Germany declares war on the United States. The United States is also going to declare war on Germany. It's important to note that this is the last time in American history that we've had an officially declared war. Um, every war that we fought in since Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Korea, all of those wars are considered police actions. This is the actual last time that the United States has declared war. Um, at this point, I will pause again and wait for questions if you have any. All right, seeing no questions, I'll go ahead and, uh, and move on. Uh, here's just an image of the, uh, the Pacific Theater and kind of, this gives you a real idea of what island hopping is all about. You can see, you just have to go, you have to take an island, then you move on to the next one. Um, some of these battles are more famous than others. Um, you know, most people know Battle of Midway, Battle of Iwo, uh, at Iwo Jima. Um, but, you know, the goal is to eventually take mainland Japan uh, in all of this. As a result of Pearl Harbor, um, in 1942, we're going to have uh, what's referred to as the Japanese internment in the United States. And essentially, um, the issue here is that people are worried that... Um, People are worried that the Japanese in the United States are actually spies for the Japanese. So over 100,000 Japanese will be relocated to what are referred to as war relocation camps. These are mostly Japanese citizens living on the Pacific Coast. Um, they send them, they're sent all over the place. Uh, they get sent to um, Arkansas in the swamps. They're going to end up in Wyoming. Um, and these are all, it's important to note, these are American citizens. Um, some of them even have um, sons or, you know, nephews or whatever fighting over in the war, fighting on the American side, and their families are still put in internment camps. And the idea behind this is very similar to slavery. You know, you, you could ask the question, why weren't all Germans, why weren't all Italians rounded up? Well... You know, it, it comes down to racism and skin color. You can tell what a Japanese person looks like, and it was just easier to uh, round them up. Um, eventually, Congress is going to apologize for this. You can see the picture down here with Reagan, um, and they're going to pay reparations to these families. Tomorrow we'll watch a, uh, a quick video of um, someone who was in one of the internment camps, uh, George Takei from Star Trek, uh, actually was rounded up and put in one of these internment camps. So tomorrow we'll uh, watch something showing um, what his experience was. But you can see not exactly the best living uh, accommodations here. Um, they're put in deserts. They're put in cold climates. And then the swamps in Arkansas. So... You know, again, nowhere anybody's going to want to live um, is where they end up. 
We're going to end up knowing a lot of names from this war off of this list. You should know Marshall, Eisenhower, MacArthur, and Patton. Um, Marshall is the U.S. Army Chief of Staff. We're going to know more about him after the war, actually, than during the war. Um, Eisenhower is going to become the Supreme Allied Commander. He's going to lead all of the forces in Europe. MacArthur is going to be the General of the Army in the Pacific. Um, and then Patton, most people know from uh, the movie, or if you haven't seen the movie, you've probably seen uh, the, the speech somewhere. And um, he's going to be the lead general in Europe. So, again, with AP US history, you don't need to know, to know specific battles. You don't need to know the military history. It's more about the causes and effects. I'm going to tell you about a couple of the battles um, and a couple of the major events that you should just know. Um, but if you want to get into the kind of nitty gritty of um, the military history behind it, probably a good idea for you to take a World War II class um, when you get to college. Usually your different schools will offer you a course in World War I, World War II, um, and Vietnam are usually offered as individual courses. So the end of World War II is uh, the famous D-Day invasion. This is what's depicted in uh, Saving Private Ryan. If you've been in Shep's class, that's the, uh, the opening scene there. Um, Eisenhower is the brains behind it. And basically, if you remember back to that map, Germany is holding all of Europe essentially, um, a, a, especially the coast, you know, the, the best staging area for the Americans is to go through um, the United Kingdom and the Germans control almost all the coast got, coastline. They're deeply entrenched. They hold the high ground. Um, but with the D-Day operation, within a, million, within a month, you're going to have a million Allied troops stationed in Europe and the Germans are essentially going to be surrounded. Um, they're going to have the um, American and British landing to the west, and on the east, the USSR, is, the Soviets are going to be um, marching towards Berlin. And essentially, it's a race to Berlin. Um, the Soviets want to get there first uh, in order to lay claims to Berlin and lay claims to Germany, hopefully, in the negotiations after the war. And the, um, the other allies want to get there from the West for essentially the same reason. They, they want to see Germany democratic because while we're working with the Soviets, we don't necessarily trust uh, communists at that point. Um, Hitler in 1945 is going to commit suicide, and after that, Germany is going to surrender. When Hitler basically sees the writing on the wall, he goes into his, a bunker with his mistress, uh, and he um, he shoots himself. This here is a uh, an image of where they're going to land uh, during D-Day. Um, kind of an interesting side story with this deals with General Patton. Um, Patton was the general that Hitler actually fears the most. But um, at one point, while he is in the United States visiting a military hospital. He, he visits a group of soldiers that today we would recognize as PTSD. Um, but again, someone with PTSD, when you look at them, you don't really see anything wrong. So Patton looks at these guys that seem to be otherwise healthy, and he thinks that it's just kind of a mental block that's keeping them from fighting the war. He actually slaps one of these uh, soldiers. That gets reported in the papers. That doesn't play very well with American citizens, and FDR is forced to pull him from the battlefield. Well, before D-Day, um, Eisenhower is looking for a distraction for Hitler, and he knows of Hitler's feelings towards Patton. So Patton, near London, is going to build, basically in this area here, Hitler's assumption is that if the Americans are going to invade, if the Allied troops are going to invade, they're going to try to do it here. It's the narrowest point in the English Channel. So they give Patton a balloon army. So he inflates a whole bunch of tanks. They put up a whole bunch of tents. Um, you know, they, it's basically you know out of out of a movie where they just have all of these background props stationed right here. Hitler, when he does reconnaissance, can't tell the difference between the props and real tanks. So he focuses on shifting his defenses over here to defend against Patton. 
Once Eisenhower sees that movement, that's his cue to go ahead and start invading at Normandy, and the rest is his history. So Hitler's respect for Patton is a large reason that D-Day is successful, even though Patton really doesn't have a hand in it. Um, next two slides here, these are probably the most famous issues. These are the, uh, the uh, troop transporters here. This is... Uh, troops storming the beach and i mean you've got to remember these guys that are doing this they're between 18 and 21 years old and they know that they're running into one of the best defended coastlines in the history of mankind they're, you know and it's kind of a just run try to get to the beach and hope you don't step on a mine or get cut down at any point Another major European battle here is going to be the Battle of the Bulge that's fought between 1944 and 1945. Um, it's kind of Germany's last stand. Um, the U.S. Army gets desegregated here because it's kind of like, okay, we just need everybody that can fight. Um, and this is going to be the battle that kind of signals to the Germans, okay, this is coming to an end. It, it, it's a bloody fight. The Germans put up a good fight, but the uh, Americans are going to be able to um, going to be able to win this one and continue pushing the Germans back into Germany. So here's some uh, important dates. Again, dates aren't huge. Just know kind of your timeline. Um, FDR is going to die on April 12, 1945. We'll talk about that tomorrow with, uh, with Truman taking over. Um, Hitler's suicide is going to happen just a few weeks later. Um, and then you're going to have the German surrender. Uh, VE Day or Victory in Europe Day is celebrated on May 7th, 1945. Um, the Allies are going to divide Germany up amongst them. Um, and essentially it's a four-way split. You're going to have the uh, United States take some, the French take some, and the British take some. And then on the other side, you've got the Soviets trying to take their piece of the pie. The, uh, after the war, we're going to have what are called the Nuremberg Trials. These are held in Germany, and they're held in Germany so the people of Germany can see that um, the people responsible for the war and for the Holocaust and other things, they want the German people to see that they're being held accountable for this. Um, so many, uh, many Germans are going to be executed and jailed for war crimes. A lot of people try to make the defense that they were just following orders. Um, they're still usually going to be found guilty um, because it's you know kind of human decency that you don't do what the a lot of the Germans did. The important thing with negotiating the peace in Europe that is on the mind of the Allies is avoiding the errors of World War I. So um, they're, they're going to make sure that they try to avoid the depression, avoid the anger from before. So that kind of bring thing, brings things to a close in Europe. But it's important to note that the war is not over. And I will pause here and award an additional extra credit point to anyone that can identify where the quote on the slide comes from. The first in chat to do it gets one more extra credit point. Congratulations to Matt Fickner. You're going to get one more point. Katie, I'll give you one more for identifying the character correctly.
So that's been noted on our little attendant sheet there. Okay, so we're still fighting in the Pacific. Um, again, I'm not going to give you kind of the order of the battles. I'm going to give you more of the idea of things that you need to know coming out of uh, the war, the first of which is the Bataan Death March. This is a march of American POWs, by, POWs being prisoners of war by the Japanese in the Philippines. Um, thousands of prisoners are going to get tortured. Uh, they're going to die. And this is going to lead to the execution of Japanese officers uh, for war crimes. Um, lots of American soldiers are going to um, suffer and die on this. Basically, if you fell out of line, you would uh, uh, you would be beaten severely, and uh, you would die. Most people know that the war in Japan is going to end uh, with the dropping of two atomic bombs, one in Hiroshima, one in Nagasaki. Um, we'll look into kind of Truman's rationale behind doing this a little bit later on, but again, it's important to know Truman is president, uh, when he takes office in April of 1945, he's been kept completely in the dark about the Manhattan Project. Um, most of the stuff happening in the war is not relayed to Truman at all, um, but this is a top-secret project. And, and um, you know, he basically finds out and has to make the decision if he's going to use the deadliest weapon in human history in the matter of months. Um, after the two bombings, Japan is going to surrender, and VJ Day, or Victory in Japan Day, is August 14th, 1945. Um, this is uh, the cloud. The bomb over Hiroshima was called Little Boy. Um, this, is, uh, this is the first atomic bomb that's ever used in a military operation. Um, it's dropped on August 6, 1945 at 8.16 a.m. Hiroshima time. Um, they're going to explode the bomb 1,900 feet above the courtyard of a hospital, Shima Hospital. Um, and it's going to have the explosive force of 12,500 tons of TNT. Um, so many people are going to die immediately. Um, that's that's going to be 140,000 die immediately within five years because of exposure to radiation or other causes. Another six, 60,000 people are going to die. So from one bomb, 200,000 Japanese are going to perish. In Nagasaki, the bomb is called Fat Man. Um, this one is uh, going to explode at 11.02 a.m. on August 9th, 1945. This one's going to detonate 1,650 feet above um, Nagasaki. 22,000 tons of force on this one. Um, by the end of 1945, 70,000 people are going to die in Nagasaki. And within the next five years, an additional 140,000 people will die because of exposure to this. So in total, two bombings, you know, just two bombs are going to kill over 200,000 people. And this gives you an idea of how close together Hiroshima and Nagasaki are. There's a big argument about whether or not these are military targets or civilian targets. Um, the way that the war had been kind of sold and interpreted by the Americans, um, every Japanese person was considered a, uh, a soldier. So by striking the city, killing men, women, and children, um, the United States is still going to view this as a military target, even though there's a lot of civilians there, because all of the Japanese, the U.S. felt, were willing to die for the cause. Uh, this is an image of the bomb, the uh, bombers that dropped the bomb over Hiroshima, the plane uh, called the Enola Gay. That there is the picture, and again, that relatively small bomb is going to be responsible for killing 200,000 people. Um, here's an idea of how widespread the damage for one of these bombs is. Um, you're going to have fire and blast damage uh, going out about 2,000 2, yards 
and blast damage going out five, six thousand yards um, from the site where the bomb is detonated. Um, people that are in closer essentially incinerated immediately. People that are further away are going to um, are usually going to die a much more painful and slow death. Um, here you see an image of Hiroshima before and after the bombing. You can see the hospital right here. And you can see this is a big metropolitan city. I mean, this is similar to what New York would look like if you saw it from the air. And then after the bomb is dropped, you can see it's basically completely flattened to the ground. Um, you can still see the, the imprint from the roadways, but the buildings, you know, kind of the third dimension of the, the rise of buildings, it's completely gone um, after the blast. Here's another uh, another image showing the after effects in Hiroshima. Kind of a little bit in closer, and you can see, you know, the buildings that survive, no windows. The windows are essentially blown out, but you can see everything else is completely flat um, around where the bomb is dropped. Uh, this here is a uh, a watch that stopped right at the time of the explosion, uh, 8.15 a.m. Um, and you can see here it's, it's enough to melt glass up to uh, 900 meters away. That's almost a half mile away. You can melt glass bottles from where this bomb um, exploded. And you can see it, it's a 1,000-foot fireball um, that's going to result from this. So... That is a fireball that is bigger than three football fields. If you were outside at the time of the bombing, your clothes would be burned off your body or even burned into your body. Um, <clears throat> many people are going to bear you know, the wounds from the bombing for the rest of their lives. Here's some images from Nagasaki. Again, the before and after. <clears throat> you can see, again, thriving city, and then virtually nothing built up after the bomb is dropped. Here, more of the ruins from after the bombing. <clears throat> uh, today, uh, in Nagasaki, uh, the Ground Zero has been made into kind of a peace gardens. The city has been built up back around it. Same with Hiroshima. You can see the city is built up around it. Um, the worries from radiation poisoning at this point are minimal, but they do still exist. And the memorials here are dedicated essentially to world peace and are they hope to serve as reminders to never go through this again. Uh, here we have a picture from the official surrender of the Japanese. <clears throat> we'll close this out by talking about the the death toll. Um, you know, the idea of military and civilian deaths. You can see the Soviets and even the Chinese in Asia are going to be hit the hardest by this. Um, but the interesting thing to look at it are these blue graphs for the percentage of the population. Um, and, and you can see for the Soviet Union and for countries like Lithuania, Latvia, Germany that are kind of where a lot of the fighting on the Eastern Front takes place, very high portions of their populations, you know, the Polish, are, are going to be basically eradicated as a result of this war. Um, and you can see... Um, the United States, you know, in terms of they're only going to suffer military deaths, even the United Kingdom, they're going to be the primary fighters, but it's going to be people in the countries that get invaded by the Germans that are most impacted. The war is going to end with a series of uh, peace conferences, the Yalta Conference. It would not be a uh, snow day presentation if one of my kids was not crying in the background. Um, the Yalta conference is going to decide how um, to 
in one part split up uh, Europe, but mostly to talk about what to do with these war criminals, what to do with the Germans and the Japanese um, after the war. The Potsdam Conference, you can see Truman's going to be here. It's going to be after FDR's death. Um, the issue here is how are we going to divide Berlin? Um, when they divide Germany, Berlin is in the Soviet zone, but obviously the, uh, the Allies are not going to want to give up uh, the capital of Germany to the Soviets. So they're going to decide to divide um, Berlin itself into four sections within that Japanese sec or within that Russian section. <clears throat> then uh, the last of the declarations you need to know is the Potsdam Declaration. <clears throat> and this is going to outline the terms for Japanese surrender. And with that, I'm done. Uh, make sure you pay attention to the stuff on the haiku page as far as due dates are concerned. Um, tomorrow in class, you have a vocab quiz, uh, the second part of the vocab. Thursday, you've got the Wilson presidential outline quiz. Friday is the FDR presidential outline quiz. Um, and tomorrow, we'll also talk more about the home front in World War II. I'll stick around for a little bit longer in the chat if there's any questions. Otherwise, I will see you tomorrow.